Welcome to the recorded version of Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap, State and Local Public Health Partnerships to Address Dementia, from December 18th, 2018, part of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series sponsored by the Administration for Community Living. Thank you so much, Steve. Welcome, everyone, to the webinar today on the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap. We'll be talking about state and local public health partnerships to address dementia. In this webinar series, the Administration for Community Living's National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center has partnered with the American Society on Aging. We're pleased to have all of you in attendance today. Before we start, Erin Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Erin? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy days to join us to um, hear about the newly released um, Healthy, Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Lisa McGuire from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Susan Engels from Washington State Department of Health and Social, Health, of Social and Health Services um, with us to um, inform us about what is about the new plan and what they've been doing in the state of Washington. Uh, with that, thank you again for joining us and back to you, Sari. Thank you. So for today's webinar, as you just heard from Erin, we'll be hearing from Dr. Lisa McGuire and Susan Engels. Dr. Lisa McGuire is the lead of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program, which houses the congressionally appropriated Healthy Brain Initiative. She joined the CDC in 2004 and has published over 100 articles and book chapters on various aspects of cognition, disability, caregiving, and aging. Also with us today is Susan Engels. Her social service career started in the field with the Area Agency on Aging in Bellingham, Washington, working as a senior information and assistance specialist, and then as a AAA case manager serving in-home Medicaid long-term services and supports recipients. She's been with the Washington State Department of Social and Health Services in the Aging and Long-Term Support Administration headquarters for the past 16 years. We're happy to have both of them with us today, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Lisa McGuire for the presentation. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to present to you all today and share with you our latest roadmap from the Healthy Brain Initiative. So to set the stage for us today, first I want to point out that Alzheimer's disease is the fifth leading cause of death for Americans age 65 years old and older. It's the sixth leading cause of death for all ages. We know, based on some recent CDC analysis, that we do see racial and ethnic disparities in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, but at the same time, we do expect that that prevalence will uh, nearly triple by, the, by 2060. So just a few more facts that I would like to use to set the stage to show where some of our national priorities and agendas come from. So one of the things that we know is about 35% of people who are diagnosed with dementias or their caregivers are actually aware of their diagnosis. This is a Healthy People 2020 objective to increase that number and has been proposed for Healthy People 2030. The second fact I like to point out is about 25% of hospitalizations are preventable among older adults who are diagnosed with dementia. Once again, we want to try to reduce those preventable hospitalizations, which this is also a 20, Healthy People 2020 objective and has been proposed again for Healthy People 2030. Now, a couple other things that I'd like us to think about as we're setting the stage for today is that we know that about 95% of Medicare beneficiaries with dementia have one or more other chronic health condition. So we want to keep in mind that the people that we're talking about today and the people that we're serving and working with probably don't just have dementia. They probably have some other chronic health condition, whether it's hypertension, cardiovascular disease, depression, but there's something else as well within their health health. We also know that it's about 70% live alone um, in community settings, which is the, many of the folks that you all work with. And we also know when we talk about caregivers that about one in three report that their health has worsened as a result of caring for someone. Now, CDC is a public health agency, and I like to put into perspective what that actually means and how we do work and how we work a little differently than some of the sister agencies within the Department of Health and Human Services. So a traditional approach, such as the medical model approach, is on the left-hand side here, where we typically work with one person at a time. So teaching one person at a time or training one person at a time, which is still is an extremely valuable thing to do and is very important. 
On the right-hand side, what public health does is we try to train as many people at a time as possible. And the way that we do that is through going through existing systems and structures, such as accrediting body or through um, agencies that are administering grants. But we're trying to serve as many people as possible with one single time. Dr. David Satcher, former CDC director and Surgeon General, recognized that Alzheimer's disease is the most unrecognized threat to public health in the 21st century. So based on some of the things we've talked about today, we do see that that brain health and Alzheimer's disease and cognition are public health priorities. So CDC in 2005 uh, received congressional funding to start the Healthy Brain Initiative, and the purpose of this initiative is to advance cognitive health as a central part of public health practice. And we can see a little bit of the history here. I want to just point out a couple things. Our first roadmap uh, was released, uh, the congressional support was in 2005. The first roadmap was released in 2007. We saw in 2010 that dementia, including Alzheimer's disease objectives, were first added to the Healthy People series. Um, and the National Alzheimer's Project Act was signed into a law in 2011, which results in the annual plans produced through that. The first one was produced in 2012. Uh, and then last we're going to talk about today is our third roadmap in the series, which was released a couple months ago. So the roadmaps are um, expert guided. With we had about 150 experts that were involved in the development of this roadmap. Um, we led various uh, consultations with stakeholder groups, had work groups established by leadership committee. We really looked at what had what actions had been completed or undertaken for the second roadmap, and looked to see where where we still needed to do some work within the public health sphere. Also looked at the science. Uh, looked in where the science and the field tends, we think it could be going within the next five years to identify those actions that we'll talk about for as we move forward. A couple things that we kept in mind is we kept in mind that our, our our roadmap series has been designed historically for state and local public health agencies. We have continued that focus, but we've also developed a separate roadmap for tribal and native health leaders, which will be released this spring. Other things to keep in mind is we adopt a life course perspective when we are thinking about Alzheimer's disease and dementia. We expanded actions on dementia caregiving and risk reduction moving forward. So I mentioned the life course perspective. So what this wheel is showing us is showing us on the left-hand side is we're seeing birth, the right-hand side we're seeing death. And so what the inside of the circle is allowing us to see is the life course perspective for a person who will develop Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So we see people start with healthy cognitive aging and then those who develop symptoms progress through the phases. And, and sometimes progress all the way through the phases and sometimes do not progress all the way through the phases. The outer side of the, the outer rim of the wheel or of the, the circle shows us where public health and where we all have an opportunity to intervene. So first we can see the risk reduction. So we see that risk reduction tends to be more effective in the healthy phases through the mild cognitive impairment. We also see that early detection and diagnosis um, is a, a key priority from pre-symptomatic to, um, to the early dementia phases. And then we see from mild cognitive impairment uh, in dementia, we see quality of care. So the new roadmap uh, follows the essential services of public health. And you can see on the wheel on the right-hand side the four service, essential services of public health that are a priority item, priorities moving through for this roadmap. So the first area is educate and empower. So I did mention that we have 25 action items. So the list I'm going to show you today is a little bit shorter. And these are the items that we consider, the leadership committee considered to be priority actions. One of the questions that we frequently get is there's, there's a lot of items. Uh, we don't have a lot of resources to implement these items. Where should we start? So these 25 items have been identified as being ripe for implementation. So they fit into those four categories of law with the essential services of public health. The first series of items are educate and empower. So these are educating the public through various ways and really trying to give um, consumers information and, that they need to make decisions um, and to move forward. 
The next category is developing policies and mobilizing partnerships. We know that it's very difficult to do things alone and organizations doing them in silos. We know that things work more um, effectively when groups partner together and work together, and we can see some actions that are emphasizing that. The third category is assure a competent workforce. So we know that the number of older individuals who either have dementia or are being diagnosed with dementia is increasing, and we can see based on Dr. Kevin Matthews' paper, we expect that that will nearly triple over time. So we need to be thinking through the workforce. So do we have workforces and professionals in place to prepare and to care for those individuals? So this priority set of priority items is looking at making sure that we have public health and health care professionals in place to assess and to help people with dementia and their families in the coming years. Then last, we have monitor and evaluate. One of the primary ID or of primary pillars of public health is being able to monitor and really count and, and find out how many people have a specific condition. So in other words, what is the prevalence? What is the burden of a specific condition or um, something in a geographical area? And so that's something that we do with at CDC. We administer the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and we have a cognitive decline module and also have a caregiving module. And so we're encouraging states to implement those modules so they can have data for their specific state and also so that information can be utilized within that state. So here's just a little preview of our cognitive decline module. You can see the, the map of the United States shows the states that have administered the module. Those states that have shading have administered in the years that you see the colors of the shading on there. Um, then we can see the types of things that this module asks. So in other words, our a person's memory problems worsening over time. Have they interfered with their daily life and the way they've adjusted their schedule? And have they discussed it with a health care provider? We know based on some other CDC analysis, we know that about one in nine people over the age of 45 report that they have changes in their cognitive functioning, and that about half of those individuals have talked with their health care provider about that. So with our caregiving surveillance module, it's ask of adults 18 years old and older, so it asks if a person is a caregiver. If they are a caregiver, what are some of the problems they face? What are their care needs? And if they're not currently a caregiver, do they anticipate being a caregiver in the next two years? So CDC has this data available. It is free and downloadable on our website, cdc.gov aging. And these are examples of the infographics that we have developed at the national level for both the caregiving and the subjective cognitive decline module. We also have those available for each of the states that have participated. So what can you do as aging network professionals? So national organizations can continue and help raise awareness. They can educate their members and their constituents. State and local aging and disability uh, organizations can really help share the roadmap with the public health professionals within their state or locale and work together and partner to help implement those roadmap actions as well as to identify shared goals that can be worked towards. So I mentioned a little few minutes ago that we have forthcoming a roadmap for Indian Country. Um, this will be released in the spring of 2019, and it's really tailored for tribal and native leaders to engage their communities on Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And it's really focusing on uh, reducing the risk of cognitive decline, advancing early detection, providing support for caregivers, and once again, that public health pillar of monitoring and evaluating. So we know Alzheimer's disease affects millions of people. It's costly, it's growing, and public health does have an opportunity now to act and to stimulate some strategic changes in policy, systems, and environment. And we hope that this new roadmap will help chart that course for a dementia-prepared future. So for more information, please check out our website, cdc.gov aging. And I thank you very much for your time, and my contact information is here. And I will turn it over to Susan Engelblau.
Susan? Susan, are you perhaps on mute? Sure enough, I am. So sorry about that. That's okay. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, good day to you all, and thank you for the opportunity to share what Washington State has been working on in the dementia space. With medical advances increasing longevity, we find that Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death is markedly on the rise when compared with other selected causes of death. Um, in particular, I'd point out heart disease and stroke, uh, as fewer people are uh, passing away from those, they age into uh, the dementia space. But opportunity exists. The, the Lancet Commission presented a life course model showing potentially modifiable risk factors for dementia. While many factors are not potentially modifiable, such as your basic genetics, uh, and specific genetics, a number of factors have been identified that depending on when the change is introduced can reduce risk of developing dementia. Percentage reduction in new dementia cases of dementia, if this risk is eliminated in early life, if education is improved, could be 8%. Beginning in midlife, if hearing loss is addressed, 9%. Hypertension and obesity, 2% and 1%. The in the late life, you can see smoking at 5%, depression 4%, physical inactivity, social isolation, and diabetes are all factors that could be potentially be modified and reduce people's risk of developing dementia. There we go. So um, public health messaging could be impactful related to the modifiable risk factors, but the aging network also needs to modify how people think about dementia. So currently there are misbeliefs that why bother getting a diagnosis? And this exists not only for the public, but also medical professionals may withhold the diagnosis. Uh, folks think, oh, this is just getting older and nothing can be done, and, and physicians don't know how to help their patients. There's also stigma and fear that leads to isolation of the person and family, and then lack of disease knowledge, um, so there's no planning for the future. So we need to make the change, and we are the change. In the future, we want to recognize the benefits of, of early detection uh, create acceptance, hope, and empowerment so that there can be greater connection with others and increase the understanding of the disease and the services that are available and also engage early in legal, financial, and advanced care planning. This figure depicts a model for viewing Alzheimer's from both the life course perspective and a coordinated systems approach. It is critical moving forward to recognize the opportunities to make impacts at each stage, stage and to coordinate among care systems to improve outcomes for people with dementia and their family caregivers. Public health and aging networks need to partner together along with the healthcare system to foster real system coordination and improvement. So I'd like to talk a bit about the Washington State Plan to address Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. One of the resources that we uh, looked at while this was in development was the second version of the Healthy Brain Initiative. So there are many similarities along the way. So the plan it has seven major goal areas, increasing public awareness, engagement in education, preparing communities for increases in dementia, ensuring well-being and safety, ensure access to family caregiver supports, identify dementia early and provide evidence-based care, 
ensuring long-term services and support in the setting of choice, and promoting innovation and research related to causes and care. And those uh, seven areas broke into three, three general um, committees that align with the service systems. So we have a health subcommittee, a long-term services and support subcommittee, and a public awareness community readiness committee um, that aligns with public health. So um, our focus without funding uh, in the beginning was through heightened collaboration, figure out what we could get done within our existing resources through collabor collaboration and partnership. And this was also public-private, so not only in state, state government, but also bringing in private partners such as the Alzheimer's Association and higher education. So the, the DAC, the Dementia Action Collaborative Health and Medical team was led by Dr. Chris Rhodes, a neuropsychologist on faculty with the University of Washington. And uh, so he led to convene an expert panel to identify and endorse evidence-based standards, and also to identify and recommend validated cognitive screening tools. So to do this, uh, in the beginning, we surveyed physicians. And it, the survey showed that they needed tools to um, know how to diagnose and tools to tell them what to do once a diagnosis was made. Uh, so we harnessed the Bree Collaborative, which is a Washington State governor appointed uh, body that works to improve healthcare quality outcomes and affordability. And the Bree Collaborative agreed to take on uh, this project. So dementia is significantly underdiagnosed with many reasons. People frequently don't talk to their health provider when they notice their memory getting worse. And often, though, providers don't ask or bring up the question. So when timely diagnosis is not made, there are numerous lost opportunities. Opportunities to identify a cause for cognitive change that may be reversible, or opportunities for available treatment for symptoms that can be uh, more effectively managed early on. Opportunities for a better care plan to manage other health conditions such as diabetes or hypertension. And for education support and early legal and advanced care planning. Ultimately, these lost opportunities can lead to less than optimal outcomes and higher costs. So the, the work group pulled together for a year to develop uh, several uh, deliverables. And you can see this at the uh, link below, the bottom of the screen. But here, here is one of them, a clinical provider practice tool. We adapted this from the work of Minnesota's Act on Alzheimer's, which offers a graphic representation of the dementia screening and diagnostic process, along with resources for practitioners to offer individuals and family during the process. And the second uh, item on the screen, which I don't expect anyone to read, just to make that clear, uh, this is the cognitive screening position paper that responds to the finding in our in our primary care survey uh, that indicated that many of the clinicians were unclear about what to do. The good news is they want to learn more, and the state is working on ways to disseminate this out into the provider network. The next uh, DAC subcommittee I'll talk about is the long-term supports and services. So um, we developed um, a roadmap specific for family caregivers. This is a little confusing with the Healthy Brain Initiative roadmap, but this is a, this is a different product. Um, we also look to expand and promote early stage groups and to identify and engage leaders of diverse tribal populations to explore needs. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the first two. So here's about the, the family caregiver roadmap. So families really need to know what to expect over, over time and how to help. 
um, during our listening tour for our, our Alzheimer's state plan, we got clear messages from families that they uh, weren't or aren't prepared. And when dementia strikes, they're unclear about what to expect and where to turn. They, want, they asked for a basic but thorough roadmap to guide them through important action steps and to know where to find help along their way. So the project team, led by one of our family caregivers, is an example of the value of co collaboration. The document integrates insights from many different perspectives and sectors. For example, there's lessons from family caregivers. There's ideas for promoting health for both the caregiver and the care receiver, uh, for health uh, medical needs. Legal and advanced care planning is important, and the importance of palliative and hospice care So here's a peek inside. There's, uh, it uses a visual timeline to move through the stages of dementia, and then also has uh, listings so you can skip through to the to the one that you might be most interested at the at the moment, um, and also a quick reference guide, communication tips, resources, and an action step summary. So here's a sample of what you might find uh, inside. There's a section on things that you can do and study and learn, and then it's boiled down to action steps so that people really clearly know what they they would want to accomplish at different different uh, stages in the in the disease process. So another initiative was working on uh, Alzheimer's or memory cafe model. So uh, the, the group got uh, together and uh, produced some materials that would be helpful for um, private partners who might want to conduct web uh, to start cafes or dementia-friendly walking programs, um, some how-tos on how to get it done. And so four webinars uh, happened in this last year, and many groups have, have started as a result. So next, I'm going to talk about the uh, Public Awareness Community Readiness Committee and some of the things that they worked on. Uh, one of their recommendations was inform and educate about uh, healthy aging and brain health. And uh, to do that, they utilized um, an ongoing grant uh, from the Alzheimer's Association and um, and ASTHO, which is the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Um, and that helped them look at disparities with AAPI, as Asian American and Pacific Islanders, and African American projects. Uh, also to identify elements for dementia-friendly communities and uh, import, incorporate content about dementia uh, into other products um, of the community health worker training that is done by Department of Health. We also compiled educational materials about safety. So here's a little bit more about the brain health messaging that was done through the ASTHO grant. So the, um, they created an evidence-based message in partnership. Uh, we did that, this with the Department of Health and created these fans that were used in Memory Sundays in four African-American churches in June. And we believe that over 400 people were reached with that message. So that's just one, one um, example of how, how to utilize those partnerships. Uh, the Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, project conducted four focus, excuse me, six focus groups with Chinese and Japanese adults with older relatives considering acceptable messages of concerning cognitive health and created action guides, one for providers and one for policymakers. And this was out of that same ASTO grant. So, and then dementia friend, friendly communities. Here's uh, the, the product that was created, uh, the fact sheet, was made available on our web page, and we're uh, exploring opportunities for resource sharing, which led to webinars, and linking this with statewide associations through conference pre presentations, such as with the State Library Association, 
uh, Recreation Association, and YMCAs. So uh, this is the integration of age-friendly, dementia-friendly friend initiatives. And last but not least here, community health worker training. This was a really important uh, new partnership with the Department of Health that was able to uh, utilize funding from an ACL grant uh, to put in a self-paced module into their community health worker training to help folks be more aware of brain health, warning signs, and community resources. And this will be offered on a regular basis by the Department of Health. And right now there are about 1,900 community health workers in Washington uh, that receive the core training from the Department of Health. So this is a great way to get, get this information out. Oh, I guess that wasn't the last one. One more, dementia safety kit information. So this is another, another piece that you can find on, on the DAC website. Uh, so this is for families struggling with, with uh, safety issues who want to help folks be safe and stay independent in their homes and also addresses that people with dementia are vulnerable to financial exploitation and abuse. So we curated an info kit into PDF format to disseminate. So end of life planning is an important tenant in all of this and is woven throughout in the dementia roadmap, in the Brie Collaborative um, tools for physicians. Uh, about the, the need to encourage discussion and manage the basics at the end of life. Uh, folks who haven't, haven't made their wishes known can end up with, with interventions that they may not have wanted had they been able to plan in advance. So um, the dementia uh, Action Collaborative shows all the, the different ways that partners can come together and, and the sum of the parts are greater than the whole. I'm going to talk a little bit now about aging and what, what we can bring with our history. We, in Washington State, we have a long history of serving family caregivers because approximately 80% of care in the state is provided by unpaid family members and other unpaid caregivers and that but being an unpaid caregiver has economic impact on families they they have loss of earning potential decreased savings for retirement there are impacts of their ability to provide for their own children's needs uh, and increased health care costs due to their own stress and burdens if just one-fifth of the unpaid caregivers stopped providing care it would double the cost of Medicaid long-term supports and services in the state of Washington. So this, this is why, why it's important. When caregivers access support earlier in their caregiving journey, before they're experiencing the highest levels of stress and burden, there's a st statistically significant delay in the use of Medicaid long-term supports and services for the care receiver. And the caregiver's health and well-being is improved. And when that happens, the likelihood of the caregiver needing Medicaid long-term supports and services is reduced. So Washington's history goes all the way back to 1989 when we had state funds to start providing some respite care services. From there, we later added uh, a more robust array of family caregiver support services, including training and supplies and equipment and so forth. Uh, then in 2001, the, the Older Americans Act got on board, and, in, and then we went on increasing our, our program uh, until 2009, we incorporated an evidence-based uh, caregiver assessment tool. And this is the tailored, tailored care uh, assessment tool. And now we've been expanding since then, and our next, our next initiative, our current initiative, 
is getting federal funding to help pay for, for these caregiver services. And I'll be speaking more about that in a, in a bit. So family caregiver support program improves the outcomes for family caregivers. But there are challenges in implementing and sustaining a family caregiving practice. It's, it's challenging to find effective ways for family and other unpaid caregivers to recognize their role in caregiving and that they deserve the support that meets some, some needs that they may have. It's important to reach caregivers before it's too little too late uh, when people are at their breaking point, so engaging early on. Also, uh, evidence-based interventions uh, are, are pretty expensive to train and deliver, so we need to find more efficient ways to do that. These are interventions um, such as the T-care the T assessment itself is an evidence-based intervention. Uh, STAR-C is another uh, intervention that addresses behaviors in home uh, for for caregivers who are stressed by those behaviors of people with, with Alzheimer's disease, other dementias. Uh, another, another significant issue is a respite care worker shortage. So uh, as it was, is the case with other long-term supports and services provider issues, home care agency staffing challenges, you know, this is another, another challenge. And we continue to find uh, ways to address memory loss in the Alzheimer's state plan as it examines the use of the support for the vast number of people with dementia. So the 1115 demonstration builds on the success of our family caregiver support program that even with all the challenges, it, was a, it is a successful model and so we received approval from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to offer uh, Medicaid Alternative Care, which is a new choice designed to support unpaid caregivers who are also eligible for Medicaid services, both uh, financially receiving Medicaid medical, but also functionally uh, for LTSS. And then tailored supports for older adults, which is a new eligibility group for folks who are at risk of spending down to impoverishment. So they also meet the, the functional eligibility of nursing facility level of care. Uh, and their income is, is at um, a level of no more than 300% of the uh, federal benefit level. Uh, but their resources can be up to what it would cost in Washington State for six months of nursing facility level nursing facility care, which is about uh, fifty five thousand dollars. So considerably more than the two thousand now in resources that Medicaid allows. So within these two programs, um, it is a five year demonstration uh, with about $140 million of funding available. We are growing enrollment. Our target is 4,500 individuals. The benefits are broken into uh, the same categories as our family caregiver support program with caregiver assistance services that could take the place of those typically performed by an unpaid caregiver. This could be like respite or adult daycare. Uh, training and education to assist caregivers with gaining skills and knowledge to care for the recipient. Specialized medical equipment and supplies, good, goods and supplies needed by the care receiver. Health maintenance and therapies. So these would be clinical or therapeutic services for caregivers to remain in their role or for a care receiver to remain at home. This could include things like massage therapy or bringing, bringing in um, occupational therapy. Uh, and then there's also a grouping for people without uh, unpaid caregivers that uh, those uh, individuals could have personal assistance services instead of the respite type services. So credit to, to CMS for allowing Washington to, to test also presumptive eligibility that allows us to bring in services very quickly uh, without having to go through a full eligibility process. Uh, 
and also waiver of client responsibility or cost sharing uh, part of their income, and also waiver of estate recovery to make these services more palatable to, to folks who um, may need caregiver assistance. So the, the key takeaways that, that I'd like to put forward today are that, that the systems, public health, aging and long-term services and supports, and healthcare must work together to address the increasing Alzheimer's and dementia crisis. If, if we don't leverage each other's skills and abilities and specialties, um, this crisis will be on us. And uh, if the demographics just increase our funding, there it would be extremely challenging, if not impossible, for public funding to keep up with the public demand. Another takeaway, public education, um, supportive services for families and individuals, like I was just talking about, and well-informed medical practitioners are all key components. So we talked about a few of these um, in ways that Washington has been working on these, and uh, but it, it takes it takes a three-legged stool to to have something that will balance out here. So all of the of the partners need to be involved. Um, data and messaging will be vital to tell the story of to increase the funding and reverse the stigma. So. Um, participation, and I didn't really uh, go deeply into that, but the the BRFIS, um that Lisa men mentioned, uh, the surveillance survey, uh, is important to advocate for in your state. So uh, with these kinds of advocacy, hopefully we can make those systems change changes and change the culture uh, that I talked about at the beginning of my of my uh, presentation. So thank you very much. And uh, my, or my contact information is here, uh, plus um, the web link to reach the dementia resources sources that were referenced in this presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for your presentations. That was really helpful information for everyone. Um, I just want to remind everyone you can enter your questions into the Q&A feature of the webinar, which should appear on the webinar platform. So you can enter your questions in that um, section for them to be asked. Um, we'll start off with some of the questions that have already come in. Um, uh, Dr. McGuire, can you talk a little bit about the rationale for developing the separate roadmap for Indian Country? Yes, thank you so much for that question. And one of the reasons the Leadership Committee brought up the point and thought that it would be a very good, a very good idea for us to develop a separate roadmap is number one was looking at the disparities we see high prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias in people who are American Indian and Alaska Native, um, just as we see it in other racial ethnic groups, but that's one reason. The second reason is keep in mind our roadmaps are designed for public health professionals and typically state and local public health professionals. And we know that tribal public health systems work a little bit differently and can be structured very differently um, depending on the tribes, um, whether they're recipients of Indian health services, um, whether they're compacted tribes, gaming tribes. So that was one of the main reasons, those are the two main reasons that we chose to develop a roadmap for Indian Country was because the systems are very different that are in play versus those that are within the traditional public health systems and the disparities. Great, thank you. Um, Susan, someone asked um, if the Dementia Action Collaborative is um, taking any action to have the caregiver roadmap um, reach underserved populations, and in addition, are there any plans to create a version for uh, Latino populations? Uh, yes, we are looking to translate the roadmap into Spanish that has been contracted out and will be accomplished this year. Uh, and we're also looking for translation into uh, other populations as well. Uh, it's been interesting that that the the caregiver roadmap has been our the most popular, wildly popular uh, 
deliverable that has come out of the, the Dementia Action Collaborative. And a number of states and organizations have asked to uh, be able to use it and reprint it. We even have a version uh, from the Seychelles Islands in, in their language with their photographs. So um, we do hope to be reaching many more populations. And we are certainly open to uh, folks inquiring with us how they might be able to, to use the materials. Great, thank you. Um, and always um, important topic to talk about is, um, Susan, someone has asked, how was this effort funded, the Dementia Action Collaborative? Can you talk a little bit about your funding? Well, we, we weren't given any funding, so um, initially we used um, Older American Act Title III-B administrative funding to do the bare minimums to bring the, the, the uh, planning group together and get the, the plan um, to completion and then to support ongoing meetings, uh, mostly travel costs, uh, that, that type of thing. Uh, for the ongoing work. We did utilize, um, again, Title III-B administrative funds from the Older Americans Act to publish the map. We've published uh, 40,000 copies to date, so we have borne the cost of that. And we're looking into uh, the possibility of seeing folks who want to order it for, for various, if, if they're not a nonprofit, that they, we might have them pay for maps the roadmaps. Great, thank you. Um, another question came in for you, Susan, about the incidence of dementia among Asian Americans. Can you talk a little bit more about your findings in that area? Uh, if you, if I may not be able offer. to, pardon? I said if there is more to offer. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the prevalence as far as the um, disparities, they're not one of the highest groups, but they are, they are very different culturally. So, I mean, they do, they do experience dementia in, in their population, but the messages that we use for uh, general population just don't resonate the same because of the, of the, the cultural expectations. So really the, the AAPI, was more about um, how to talk about dementia in this population uh, to get people to listen. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question um, about creating a more competent workforce. Um, and one of the, the question uh, alludes to the fact that there's some low enrollment in some of the uh, education programs in gerontology across the country. And they're asking if either of you have some insight on how educational institutions might engage with employers um, to have additional training on dementia. Well, I'll start. This is Lisa from CDC. Um, I mean, that's, that is a, definitely an important issue um, when we talk about gerontology and also geriatrics. But, you know, keep in mind that when we are talking about the competent workforce, we're not just talking about PhDs and MDs. We're also talking about people who are nurses, nurse practitioners, community health workers as well. Um, I think that this is definitely... Uh, we're going to have to have some creative solutions, such as what you're suggesting. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the work that we're doing in this area about creating a competent workforce is trying to get people from different angles. So it's not just getting um, people in their undergraduate and graduate careers and getting them to um, join a career take a career path that will take them into aging. So yes, we still want to do that. And so through some of our programs, through um, we do support uh, scholars um, through one of our Healthy Brain Research Network. Um, we also have training, a curriculum, a public health trick, brain health curriculum that's available on cdc.gov slash aging, which um, is a flexible, evaluated curriculum with slides, um, discussion questions, so you can take a couple slides, you can use the whole course in a course you're teaching, or use it in a community-type setting if you want to talk about brain health. 
But we need to think about getting people early and training them for their career. We also need to talk about people who are existing professionals who um, may have been trained you know, 10, 20 years ago as science has changed or curriculums have changed. So we also need to think about offering continuing education as well as also getting into licensure and board exams for those people who are credentialed in those ways. So there's a variety of prongs that we need to work to create that competent workforce. Susan, do you want to go ahead and add to that? Um, yes, I, I think in Washington we would piggyback on the, nas the national efforts for, for the, those types of workforce, but I'd like to add about um, our, our concerns around the, the direct care workforce, the, the personal care attendants and so forth. So we do have initiatives about developing that workforce here in Washington, and we are reaching out into high schools. We've developed, uh, we, we require certification in Washington. It's a 70-hour course, 75 hours with safety and orientation, and reaching that out into high schools to offer it as, as um, a course where they could take take the, the hours, and then when they turn 18, they would be ready to take the certification exam and be ready to enter the workforce with, with a skill that is much in demand and pays a, a pretty reasonable wage um, here in Washington State, beginning wage uh, $15 an hour. So we're doing beginning that work with high schools. Where it's a pilot at this point. And then also reaching out to community colleges um, in the in the same sort of way. So we are really concerned about workforce uh, capacity and taking steps to uh, work on that. Great, thank you. I just want to remind everyone there's a few questions coming in asking about where to access the slides and will there be a webinar recording. Just as a reminder, the slides should be downloadable um, right now from the webinar platform that you're looking at and also the slides and the recording will be posted both at the nadrc.acl.gov website and the American Society on Aging website very soon. So um, let's get to a few more questions. Um, Hmm. You, you mentioned in the presentation that about 70% of people with dementia live in community settings. Um, do either of you have any data about how many people with dementia live alone in the community? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have that stat. This is Susan. And this is Lisa. I don't have that stat on the top of my head. Um, but I know that we do have that available in some CDC publications, so I can get that for you. Um, it, is a, it is a decent number. I want to say it's somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Um, it's higher than, I think, it, it's enough that gives those of us in the field pause um, when we're thinking about the, that people with dementia who, may or, who also may not have um, access to caregivers in their lives. Um, and also, I think, you know, an interesting thing for us to think about is um, thinking about what we refer to as orphaned elders, so in other words, people who didn't have children and find themselves um, alone as well, too. And we do not have statistics at CDC on that aspect, um, but I can gather the other one for you on the number who live alone. Great, thank you. And there's also some resources on people who live alone with dementia on that NADRC website that I mentioned that could be helpful to folks. Um, Another question um, for Susan, it was about uh, Washington's cognitive screening position, and uh, does that apply to uh, all dementias, um, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, et cetera, um, or just to Alzheimer's disease? No, that applies uh, to Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, so that position paper is for all of that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm just looking through the rest of the questions here, try and get to one or two more. Oh, do either of you know if the one-fifth of unpaid caregiver statistic that was mentioned is true for other states? There was um, a statement that if just one-fifth of the unpaid caregivers stopped providing care, it would double the cost of long-term services and supports in Washington. 
Uh, that was that was my statement, and and I, I think the general math would hold true. Um, that's based against the the amount of funding that Washington puts into our LTSS, but I imagine that it's it's not dissimilar from other states, and um, the the eighty percent I think is is pretty common across all of the states that eighty percent of care is provided by unpaid caregivers. Great, thank you. Well, we have a few, uh, just a few more minutes left. I want to um, give a thank you again to Dr. Lisa McGuire and Susan Engels for their wonderful presentations today and for teaching us so much about the Healthy Brain Initiative and um, the Washington efforts um, surrounding the Healthy Brain Initiative and the roadmap created. Um, so I want to also remind you that our next webinar in this series will be January 30th about measuring outcomes and the, for people with dementia and the benefits of doing so. And with that, thank you to today's presenters, and I want to turn it over to um, Steve Moore for some final comments. Great. Thanks, everyone. Great presentation today. Uh, we want to thank you all for joining today.